uh, the reason uh, for later uh, um, introducing the idea of uh, ESS was, in fact, to provide a uh, forum for, uh, even if you will, um, engineers that work in geophysics. And uh, I'm one of them. I've, I've built that thing you see another thing i built recently it's an autonomous vehicle and that's one of my engineers standing on the propulsion part of this thing uh, but uh, building instruments has been very important just like in physics um, instrument construction building using is a critical part of uh, the discipline of physics about LIGO and the work that went into that which actually was in the origin story goes back to a geophysical instrument um, and it was an extension of that to this particular new application that really made a huge difference in, uh, in measurements and physics so in geophysics it's the same way there there's a long history particularly in oceanography of people building and inventing uh, new instruments, but it goes back even further than that in the origin of uh, things like seismographs and, and uh, strain meters, etc. Uh, all these things required people with technical capabilities and knowledge to actually put these together so that new instruments provide new views of Earth and often re revolutionizes uh, what we do. So I thought. There ought to be a journal um, that would uh, actually publish this kind of engineering and methods. Um, this goes all the way down to uh, the computer sciences part of this. How do you build software that you can use to analyze new data in new ways? And artificial intelligence is, is probably the most recent version of this, and that's making uh, having a great impact on on uh, earth sciences and, uh, and the AGU. So that was the purpose of setting that uh, system or that journal up was to provide that environment. And in fact, I, I think it's fair to say it's been quite successful. And as uh, far as I can tell, it continues to uh, grow. It's got plenty of uh, manuscripts to work with and uh, accept some and uh, uh, the publication seems to be quite, quite successful and, and by and large uh, it adheres to the, the original origin idea of uh, providing an environment for uh, people to publish methods, including engineering. So that was, you know, that's sort of the end all and be all of the whole thing here. Um, and I, as I said, I started this when I was president, so I didn't have a lot of arguments, I guess. Uh, people accepted, yeah, this is, this is a good thing to do. Let's give it a try. And so it worked. And I think the uh, uh, journal to the AG could be quite proud of. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was... Uh, uh, open access, and uh, it's a bit of a risk because of the finances uh, in this, but um, I, I believe that, uh, that that's worked out uh, well, too, and AG is going to more and more to uh, open access stuff, too, like so many, so many journals. It's risky, uh, but insofar as I know today, and I don't had because I, I'm not involved in oper uh, running the AGU in any sense and, and haven't been really, but I think financially uh, we haven't suffered terribly from having uh, open access for many of the journals. So it was a risky thing, but many others took the same approach. It was good to be the leader, uh, just like the uh, DOI. Um, we were we were amongst the very first journals to uh, to really treat both of those things seriously, and it's uh, it the risk has paid off in in numbers of readers. Of course, uh, 
I mean, we, we've sort of talked with it, uh, the, uh, the open journal thing and for, uh, open access, uh, were big challenges. Uh, AG really had not at that point in time, uh, dealt with those challenges, uh, at all. And this was an opportunity to experiment with, uh, with, um, open access to uh to a published journal and uh so that was that was clearly the biggest challenge that was there and the worry of course was going broke publishing a journal <laughs> which is something we hadn't done before um again it's it's basically uh, in the long term, providing a uh, publishing environment uh, that people that build instruments or create methods uh, can actually publish that material in an open, uh, accessible, peer-reviewed journal and uh, make it more like physics than it is uh, geology, let's say. Um, and uh, geology generally hasn't over the years published a lot of stuff that is uh, methods or engineering related um, but uh, uh, people are doing more of that now and then, and for geophysics it was a natural because of the close ties to uh, the discipline of physics itself and so it provided a, a method similar to what is available in the physics physics literature for uh, allowing scientists and engineers to publish their new instruments or new methods or new uh, software and those uh, uh, those sorts of things and so that was uh, those values are are critical to this turning geophysics into something a little more allied with uh, physics environment uh, by publishing this kind of work. My background, uh, I, I grew up, I was born in uh, uh, the pl Great Plains of uh, Colorado in a little place called Holyoke, a very flat place. Um, it was called Holyoke, it was an Amherst nearby and uh, the names came from uh the railroads when they were first laid uh and obviously somebody from massachusetts had a lot to do with deciding what the towns would be named and so um uh, amherst holyoke and so on came from that that origin but it's a flat place uh dry and windy uh lots of wheat and cattle and that sort of thing a ranch and farm is my uh is my background and then uh I spent a year at Case Institute of Technology, it was called at the time, uh, majoring in physics. And uh, the year after that, I got an appointment to uh, Annapolis, uh, the Naval Academy. And so I went there and uh, majored in physics and math and Russian, three majors, and uh, graduated near the top of my class and uh, went to Liverpool for a year to do an MSc in physics and lived on Penny Lane, um, in fact. Uh, and the street signs came down the night that Penny Lane was uh, uh, first played on uh, radio. So now if you go back, uh, they're all painted on the stone walls or no more, uh, no more uh, street signs. Uh, to disappear, but I used to get my hair cut at the barber shop and walk by the firehouse and all that sort of thing. So it was pretty interesting uh, experience and uh, very different than uh, anything I'd done before. But then after that came back and uh, became a submariner. I spent a year and a half in school for that and how to operate a submarine and also most importantly how to manage a nuclear reactor and um, actually wound up at a at a reactor in Idaho where I trained uh, on this for six months on a reactor called 
5G, and it was the first world, the first natural circulation um, nuclear power plant in history, and it basically didn't use pumps to pump coolant around the, the thing to get rid of the heat. It was just used natural circulation, and that's what. Uh, uh, one of the modern ideas now about what future nuclear plants might look like, which is a really good idea because they're incredibly safe. They don't require, like Fukushima, they don't require uh, big of electricity to keep the plant cool. And uh, so it's a much safer thing, build, them, build small ones of these, maybe lots of them, and there'll be it would be a big contribution to uh, power um, as we look forward to uh, reducing greenhouse gases. So it all that itself comes back. But I was on two submarines. Uh, one was the Lewis and Clark and the other was the Kamehameha. And I finished up uh, being the, the chief engineer on the Kamehameha, which spent over a year in the shipyard refueling the uh, reactor plant, uh, which used a traditional approach of pumping coolant around the, uh, the system. But I, after doing that and after launching a Trident missile uh, uh, right after Apollo 12, actually, you watch that. But we, uh, after that, we launched a Trident missile of our own, and uh, I walked off the submarine and came to San Diego and Scripps, where I've been actually ever since. I got my PhD there. Marsha McNutt uh, was a classmate uh, of mine and uh, president of the uh, National Academy of Sciences. Um, so uh, I have been doing a lot of, uh, over the, the last many years, decades, building new uh, instruments and uh, so on that are uh, C4 autonomous vehicles are my favorite thing right now and have built several of those and uh, they become quite useful for making geophysical measurements in the oceans. So that's uh, that's a quick background. Scientists, I think uh, uh, the environment changes all the Time, I think, and I have to be careful about being too glib about uh, uh, the future. Uh, but I continue to believe that uh, uh, early career researchers need to understand the environment and the technologies used in collecting the data that they uh, collect in the future. And in some cases, uh, even invent new techniques of their own. I mentioned earlier this idea of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, so on. And I believe that will have a big impact on both the way we operate instruments, uh, like the autonomous vehicles I were talking, was talking about, but also uh, maximizing the uh, ability to uh, pull useful information out of the, uh, out of the environment uh, here. Um, so I I I, ha I still have I have a graduate student. Um, she um, got her degree in physics and theater at Harvey Mudd, uh, which is up in Claremont, a great school. And uh, she's just getting a start here. She's in her first year, and of course. Having to uh, sit at home, basically, just like you and I are doing, taking courses uh, over Zoom, which is a whole new experience for everybody. Um, but um, she's interested in uh, going to sea. We're beginning to get back to the ocean again. Um, I've had techs and engineers out now in the Bering Sea um, last month, and uh, uh, another is going to be leaving from the South Pacific. Uh, from scripts. Uh, shortly, it'll be gone almost two and a half months of uh, 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 re recovering and launching uh, instruments um, 
in the South Pacific for seismology, their ocean bottom seismographs. So uh, all of this is starting again. There are a lot of fits and starts with the COVID um, sequestering, uh, some failures at, uh, 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 of sequestering have happened and uh, it's delayed and made it much more complex, the problem of getting uh, to sea and back. And just the rules of uh, of where you come into port are important because some places won't let you come into port at all if you're an American. So a lot of the cha we changes we made, like the guy that's leaving from uh, two people actually leaving from Scripps, will go to the South Pacific, and uh, rather than coming back to say Morea or um, Tahiti, Papeete, they're going all the way back to Hawaii, uh, so they land in American territory again. And, uh, that's going to uh, be the modus operandi for some time working in the uh, in the Pacific or anywhere else as far as I can tell, but it, it increases the costs uh, substantially, um, increases the risks uh, involved in going to sea, but uh, it's beginning to happen and uh, Hopefully by this time next year, all this stuff will be behind us. So maybe people will be writing books about the experience. Um, but uh, early, uh, you know, I, it's the same thing. I mean, they, uh, what do you do if you're an earlier career researcher? You have to be willing to find, uh, you got to be willing to take risks, uh, risk-free education or risk-free um, career is pretty dull stuff. Um, and uh, there's no reason to saddle oneself with dull stuff. Uh, so pick something exciting, uh, something that might even require a new way of making uh, measurements, and uh, and uh, and go to it. Um, uh, you know, this go it goes all the way to to new spacecraft and and uh, new means of communications of spacecraft and low Earth orbit low earth orbit uh, systems for both sensing and for operating uh, satellite communications. Uh, this has become a very different world than it was when I first went to sea on, the, on a nuclear submarine. Uh, the means of communicating, the means by which one locates oneself on the planet have changed enormously over that period of time. And I suspect will continue to to evolve well into the future. So early career folks uh, need to be willing to take risks uh, with their careers. And uh, uh, otherwise, you know, you could wind up doing something that's really pretty dull. And uh, that would not be much fun.